right. Welcome everyone to the journey of stormwater. Thank you for joining me for a lunch and learn webinar. I will um, start this off by saying that I have a sick kiddo. I am who is with me, who's currently being occupied by others, but we may have some interruptions. So hopefully not, but just that's my fair warning. Um, so we are going to jump right in. Thank you all again for tuning in on your lunch break. And just a quick background, if you don't know me by now, I saw some familiar names in the participant list. So hello and welcome. My name is Lara Milligan. I am the natural resources agent. I work for UF IFAS Extension here in Pinellas County. We are an extension of the University of Florida. And just a little bit about me and kind of how I got to where I am now. So I am a Florida native. I know a rare breed. I went to an environmental academy in high school, which is kind of what set me on track to where I am today. I then went to the University of Florida for my undergrad and master's. And I also have, um, I'm a graduate of the Florida Natural Resources Leadership Institute. And my focus really in college and throughout that was environmental education and really connecting with the community. Stormwater outreach and education really became part of my work when I realized how much of an issue it is. So that's really what we're gonna highlight today. What I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna start off with the big picture about water because that's really important to understand that and how the whole water system works before we focus in on stormwater. So if you're like, why is this lady talking about surface water and groundwater? That's why, because it will all connect once we get into stormwater. Then I'll focus in on the small picture, which is stormwater. And if you're familiar with any of our extension programs, we always like to end with what you can do as an individual to help make an impact, a positive impact. I will also say, I'm gonna pause real quick. I know everyone's more or less familiar with Zoom. If you have a question, I'm not gonna address them until the end because I'm gonna say focus on my presentation, but there's a and a box on your screen and you can type it in there and then it just logs it for me at the end. So if you're like, oh, I don't wanna forget this, type it in there. If you type it in the chat, it might get lost. I will interact with you via the chat just to keep it a little bit engaging. So if you have the chat box open, that's great. If you don't wanna mess with that, that's also fine. So stormwater, what is it? The name might be a dead giveaway, but generally speaking, it's rainwater that runs off really any surface, whether it's streets, lawns, or other sites. So why am I talking about stormwater? Well, it's one of the major sources of pollution throughout the country. And we'll talk about why and how that happens. So greatest threats to clean water in the United States, that's been well known for a while. I'll have one slide that talks a little bit about the history of that. My efforts really started with a mini grant from the estuary program where I launched an adopted drain program, which I will talk about at the end. And right, it's my job to teach. You all are here because you care. I care that you care. So I am here to hopefully inform and educate you a little bit about stormwater. So again, starting off with big picture. It's really important that we understand that water with water, everything is connected to everything else. It's not, there's not just stormwater. Yes, that's one aspect, but that stormwater goes somewhere and which leads to that next point. Everything goes somewhere when it relates to water. So again, generally speaking, in Florida, we have water above ground and we call that surface water. We also have a critical source of water below ground and we call that groundwater. Now, groundwater doesn't always stay groundwater. Surface water doesn't always stay surface water. It's very dynamic. Those interchange, and we're gonna explore that a little bit more. And again, get into why that's important with stormwater. So springs, which we all love, hopefully, <laughs> is one way that groundwater becomes surface water. So that's one aspect of that dynamic exchange. And then there's something called a swallet or swallet, depending how you pronounce it. And that's how surface water can become groundwater. The technical definition is there a little bit more in depth, an opening where a river or stream or a portion of disappears underground into a sinkhole. And this is just a time-lapse image that kind of shows the spiraling of the water of this particular river where it is going underground. 
And then when we explore underground even more, you might be familiar if some people might just use the term aquifer when referring to groundwater, they might use those words, words interchangeably. This is looking at the different layers of aquifers beneath our feet, starting with the most shallow at the top and the most uh, the deepest level down at the bottom. So the surficial aquifer system, again, the most shallow, you can see doesn't cover the whole state, doesn't cover Pinellas County. I'm assuming everybody's tuning in from Pinellas County. Um, you can see there's a Biscayne aquifer, which is its own separate system. And then a little bit way out into the panhandle, there's a sand and gravel aquifer system. Then you can go a little bit deeper and there's a little sliver called the intermediate aquifer system, which again, Mills County doesn't quite make the cut there. Then you go a little bit deeper, and that is when we get into the Floridan aquifer. It's not the Floridian, there's no extra I at the end there. And that you can see covers the entire state. Oh, hi, Brian. <laughs> I just saw in the chat. So we have somebody from Alachua County, so I'll keep that in mind. So this is looking at that kind of in a different view. So you can again see the Floridan aquifer at the deepest level. We have the intermediate aquifer in the middle and the surficial, surficial aquifer at the top. What I really wanna point out here is we're always taught in the water cycle, you know, rain falls, it infiltrates, it percolates, it recharges our aquifer. And while that might be true eventually, <laughs> I'm just here to, to kind of highlight that, that doesn't always happen. So you can see in the case here, if water was to fall and go down into the surficial aquifer here, it's gonna hit kind of the salmon color. And if you can see that, it says it's a clay confining layer. So water cannot penetrate past that layer of clay. It can move laterally. And then eventually here, this is a spring. So it could become, go from groundwater to surface water that way, but it's not gonna really recharge the aquifer where we get the majority of our drinking water from. And if you go way over on this side of the graph, you can see there is not that confining clay layer. So the water has the ability to infiltrate and percolate down and recharge our aquifer. Now, again, I am not, I'm very grateful, I will say, <laughs> that we teach the water cycle in school. I think we could do it a little bit better. This is typically what we see when the water cycle is described I at least tried to find one that doesn't have mountains and snow for Florida, but we're taught, right? It's this beautiful cycle, rain falls, infiltrates, percolates, evaporates. But what is a huge piece, this is where you're gonna open your chat box and interact. What is a huge piece of the water cycle that is missing, that is not shown in this picture? And you can type in your responses in the chat. Yay! We have a winner. Yes, human development. So that's really what we're going to focus in on now because that's just not how the water cycle works. We have development, we have people, we have dramatically altered the water cycle. This is just one snippet to show. I'm based out of Brooker Creek Preserve up in Tarpon Springs. It's the largest remaining natural area in Pinellas County, pretty much the only green you see on the map. And so this is showing Lake Tarpon. I tried to capture the same areas in Pinellas County. So in 1926, this is what the landscape looked like. You can see kind of down in this area, lots of agricultural lands. You can see Oldsmar, there's some roads and development down there. The population at that time was only 28,000 people. Just, I like to let that sink in for a little bit. <laughs> Then we fast forward, right, we're almost 100 years from now, from that time. Population now is just shy of a million, one million people. You can see development everywhere, roads have expanded. Brooker Creek Preserve is, only stands out because it is completely surrounded by development. And all of that alterations of the landscape dramatically changes how the water cycle functions. Now I haven't updated this data, but. The point is all the same. Florida, this is from 2021, we got 56 inches of rain. This is throughout the state. 37 of that occurred during the summer months. So you might be familiar or have heard that we have the rainy season, the dry season, 
And that is very true in Florida. So we get the bulk of our rain during a certain time of year. And so that, again, when we think about how the water cycle functions can really have a big impact, especially as it relates to storm water. So now again, think, so we have pre-development over here. So think that 1926 picture of Pinellas County. At that time, rain would fall, just think Brooker Creek Preserve or some natural land near you. Rain would fall and 50, this is, you know, give or take, 50% of that would have the opportunity and ability to infiltrate into the soil. 10% of that would run off across the land, flowing elsewhere, and then 40% would evaporate in some way, shape, or form through the air or through plants. Then again, we fast forward to really what a lot of Florida is turning into, but definitely Pinellas County. This is an area showing 75 to 100% impervious cover, which is just saying we're really developed. Lots of buildings, lots of, lots of paved surfaces. So you can see in this scenario, rain event happens. <clears throat> the water doesn't have an ability to infiltrate. It's hitting a surface where it has no option other than to run off across the land. So only 15% is infiltrating down into the soils. And then we have 55 now percent running off across the landscape. And so this is really where we're focusing in on stormwater. Somebody has to manage all of that water. If we didn't have anywhere to go, we would just, every time it would rain, we would just be flooded out. So this is looking at that in a slightly different graph. Again, we'll start with pre-development. That's the solid line. And this is showing during a storm event. So you can see a large storm happens. And we'll just say, again, I keep using Brooker Creek as the example, because that's where I am. We'll just say this is Brooker Creek. So the base flow, kind of the level of the water currently, right? It's stable, stable, stable. We get a large storm. And then if we think back to that graph, only 10% of that water is running off across the surface and ultimately could go into Brooker Creek. So, and it's getting there slowly. It's going through lots of vegetation. So the water in the creek just goes up very nice and slow and gradual. And then, you know, it, in our case, it flows to Lake Tarpon. So once it gets to its receiving body of water, it goes down. Rewind to a developed area and pick really anywhere in Pinellas County <laughs> that is developed. And we have base flow of some nearby body of water. It could even be a canal. And again, large storm event happens. Now we have 55% of that storm water that has to go somewhere. So if it all ends up say in a nearby canal, the water level is gonna raise very, very quickly and a lot. There's a lot of volume, a lot of velocity. So it goes up really, really quick and then it also has to go somewhere. So it's gonna go down really, really quick. And this is where we have a lot of problems and that is what I'm gonna talk about. So now we're kind of zooming in to that small picture and I'm gonna check in. Are y'all still with me? Do we need more coffee, treats? I'll see if anyone responds in the chat and then I'll keep talking. <laughs> nope, I guess everybody's sleeping. Okay. Oh yeah, Ruth, raise your hand. Woo! Okay, Ruth is at least still with me. So we're, we'll keep going for Ruth. Erica's still with me. Yay! <laughs> so when I'm kind of breaking this up into water quantity and water quality issues. So with stormwater, in terms of quantity, like I just showed you, we have this massive amount of water that's going somewhere. That can lead to significant issues with erosion. In certain areas where that water is going, it can cause what we call stream widening. So it's eroding the banks of a stream, a creek, whatever it is, and slowly, slowly making it wider, which as long as your house isn't right on the edge of that particular body of water, might not be a huge issue. It could also lead to flooding. So if we don't have a way to manage that 55% of that stormwater, if it doesn't have somewhere to go, then it would lead to significant flooding events and that does happen in some areas. Then we also have sewage overflows, which I like to focus in on this. I don't know if you guys were around in Pinellas County when we had some big storm events several years ago and there was all this stuff in the news about having wastewater treatment plants having to dump partially treated wastewater. And if you're familiar with how the system works, you might be like, I don't understand. Like, why does a rain event mean we have to dump wastewater? 
And I'm going to help you hopefully understand that a little bit more. But first, I think this is my only pop quiz. We'll do a quick pop quiz. True, false, that leads into the answer. True or false, stormwater is treated through the same process and system as wastewater. Oh, look at you guys. So good. You guys don't need to be here. <laughs> Correct. The answer is false. So in Florida, although this graphic isn't from Florida, but this really does a good job highlighting how this works. So any water that leaves a building, whether you're flushing the toilet, taking a shower, your washing machine, that water goes down what we call a private lateral, which you own. If anything happens to this portion, it's on your dime. Then it connects to the sanitary sewer system, and this ultimately flows to a wastewater treatment facility. On the other hand, in the case of what we're calling stormwater, that water lands on any surface if it makes its way to a storm drain, which you might be more familiar with that after this presentation, but there are all these little like holes in the side of the road. And that is where the water will enter. It then goes through another um, pipe system into what we call the stormwater system, which just directs that water to some other body of water, typically what we call a stormwater pond. So there is no treatment that happens between, between the rain falling here and getting dumped into the stormwater pond in like 99% of the cases. So again, if you're thinking, okay, well, if they're totally separate, then why, when we have a storm event, are we having to dump wastewater? And this is because if you're not familiar, Pinellas County itself is a very old county. Our infrastructure, especially underground, is very old. And the technology for that infrastructure <laughs> is very old. So we have lots of cracks in our pipes. So just when we get a rain event, that rainwater again has to go somewhere. And so it can seep through into the sewer system. Every property also has what we call a yard clean out. It looks like this, sometimes it's black, sometimes it's gray, but this is a direct way to access your connection, basically your private lateral that connects to that sewer system. If your cap is missing, then that's, again, rainwater is falling directly into there, entering our stormwater system, or I'm sorry, set, entering our sewer system. So this just shows, obviously we don't have basements. This image again is not from here, but I thought it did a really good way of highlighting what we call inflow and infiltration, which again are just different ways that stormwater can enter our sewer system. Some people direct their downspouts directly into this hole. That's like, please, please don't do that. <laughs> if that's you, just say, oh, I didn't know that. And that's great. And then redirect it out into your yard or landscape. So, and again, so basically all that water just overwhelms the wastewater treatment facilities that aren't designed to manage all of that extra water. And it forces them to have to dump partially treated sewage. Now, when we look at water quality, there are several things to factor in when it comes to stormwater. First is tur turbidity, which is, you can say sedimentation or murky water. And that kind of ties into the erosion issue. When stormwater is flowing very, very fast, it's picking up sediments, it's eroding, and all of that is getting carried somewhere. And the receiving body of water gets all of that. And so when, if there's a lot of sand or silt, that it picks up, it can make the water really murky, which is a big issue because it blocks sunlight, which is critical to the overall function and ecosystem of that body of water. It can also pick up a lot of contamination along the way. Heavy metal is a really big one, and that's not something we often think about, but there's something called brake dust. Basically, every time you're breaking your car, there's um, heavy metals that can basically be deposited onto the the surface, the pavement, the roadway. And again, that stormwater is picking that up along its journey. Another thing that is actually classified as a pollutant is increased stream temperatures. So if you've ever been on a blacktop in summer, you know how hot <laughs> that surface can get. And when rain is falling, right, we all typically love rain in the summer. It's like, oh, that's so nice and cool. When it hits that surface, 
that water as it's traveling along to its final destination is warming up. And some particular organisms, plants, and animals in the receiving body of water do not like that. That's like if somebody came into your house and turned up your thermostat, you would not be happy. <laughs> so it can just put a lot of stress on the ecosystem as well. Reducing dissolved oxygen is another big issue. So nutrients can get picked up along the journey. Typically we think of nutrients as a good thing. In this case, it's just, we're altering the system so much. All of this, if it's picking up grass clippings, pet waste, um, even just natural leaf litter, all of that that's getting picked up and dumped into a particular body of water, that's all nutrients that aren't a natural part of that system. And it just feeds the algae. The algae are like, yay, thank you for all this, um, all these nutrients. The algae takes over, the algae sucks up all the oxygen, and that's what leads to fish kills. And this is just a good graphic kind of in a residential landscape. Some of the ways that we as homeowners or residents, I live in a multi, in a uh, apartment complex, no matter where you live, we all have things that we can do to help lessen our contribution to pollution as it relates to stormwater. So this is like, you probably seen this before, oil leaking from a car, whether it's yours or not, if you're in a parking lot and a rain event happens and you see this like rainbow color on the ground, that's all oil. Sometimes we fertilize in our landscape and that if you do it at the wrong time or you do it, you put too much on the landscape and then a rain event happens, that fertilizer can just wash directly into the stormwater system. Pet waste. This is a huge one that just in my time, again, most people are like, oh, it's natural fertilizer. Like I'm not going to pick up after my pet. And that is logical thinking. The issue is there are so, there's so much bacteria in dog poop that is also not a part of our natural system that can just overwhelm and lead to significant issues with what we call fecal coliform as a major contaminant in our water. I wrote a blog several years ago and did some research. <clears throat> I think we had, it was like 132,000 registered dogs in Pinellas County, and that's just registered. And then the average dog produces half a pound of poop a day. So if you're a math person anyway, you can do the math. It can be a lot of poop that is entering our waterways. And that's just gross, honestly. Some of this eventually flows into water bodies that we like to play in or fish from. So please, please, please pick up after your pet. Okay, and then I just like to highlight this. I'm not a huge history person. This is the only slide I have on history, so don't panic. But just to put it into perspective, 1972, is when the Clean Water Act was passed. Within that, there was something called the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Why they called it that, I have no idea. Most people <laughs> call it NPDES, which I don't think is any easier to say. But this is really when we said, oh, we probably shouldn't just dump our wastewater directly into the ocean. Like, again, this wasn't that long ago. Um, there was a lot, and what we call point source pollution, so pipes that were directly polluting into bodies of water. And we addressed that and there were positive, very good changes that happened, but we were finding the water was still very polluted. So we're like, well, if we're addressing point source pollution, then where is this coming from? So then it wasn't until 1979, there was a nationwide urban runoff program, which is basically supported a massive study that looked at urban runoff. And that's when they figured out, oh, stormwater runoff is a major source of pollution. Of course, you know, things take a really long time. 1987 was the first time that the Clean Water Act was amended to require permitting for stormwater. And this could get super in-depth. I tried to kind of make it as general as I could. But basically, if you were having significant inputs to stormwater, which is pretty much all of Pinellas County, the permit itself requires public education outreach, <laughs> illicit discharge, Detection and elimination. Illicit discharge is just if you're putting anything down a storm drain, really anything down a storm drain. It has to be just rainwater. You can't put your leaves down there, your grass clippings, your oil, your paint. It's not just a dump site. That is illegal, and that's part of the process for this permit. Public involvement and participation, just again, getting people involved and doing things to help improve water quality. A lot of pollution prevention efforts. 
There's water quality monitoring program, which the county does an amazing job of. Construction site runoff control. So this is huge for anywhere that's doing construction or in Pinellas County, maybe redevelopment, as well as post-construction requirements. So stormwater systems overall, regardless of where you are, if you're in an urban area, you have a stormwater system. And they are designed to manage that rainfall so that we don't have flooding. And ideally it mimics a natural process. That's where the stormwater ponds come into play. So it's going to that stormwater pond, which in itself is to be a treatment site. There's issues with that that I won't get into today. Um, and ultimately have an opportunity for those heavy metals and things to filter out in that stormwater pond system. So what we like to say for your role as it relates to stormwater runoff, don't let your runoff run off. If you have the ability to manage your property where you live in any way, shape or form or work, if you have the opportunity to let that water that falls on your landscape absorb into the soil and be filtered and ultimately replenish our aquifer if you're in a recharge area and just slowly flow somewhere. That's really what we want to aim for so that we don't lead to erosion and pollution issues. So these are some relatively easy things that you can do. Again, if you have a gutter system, please just check where that downspout is being directed. If it's going down your driveway, most people are like, get this off my property. And that makes sense, but it's not ideal in terms of stormwater quality. So please, if you can direct it into your yard or landscape where it has an opportunity to slowly flow, be filtered by the vegetation. You can create a rain garden. That's a whole nother presentation or two or three in itself, but you can definitely do some homework on that if you're interested. It's basically, if you find an area of your landscape where water already collects, you can create a specifically designed um, planted area that really helps to further enhance the filtration of the stormwater. And honestly, any vegetation that you plant in your landscape will help to slow that flow of water and it's beneficial for wildlife as well. Fertilize, okay, I remember going out with my dad with our little push fertilizer, all he ever did, he dumped that whole bag in there and we just went around the yard because we didn't know any better. <laughs> we like to really stress that you need to know your plants and when your plants are saying, hey, I need fertilizer, we don't encourage you to fertilize on a schedule. And when you do decide, hey, it's time to fertilize, please, please, please read the label and follow the instructions so that you are doing it correctly. I already talked about picking up after your pet, so I won't go into that. If you are interested in joining our adopted drain program, you can adopt a storm drain or multiple storm drains in your area if you're in unincorporated Pinellas County and just help to keep it free and clear of litter and debris to help with some of these stormwater issues that I mentioned. You can, it's a super long URL. You can honestly just go on any search engine and type in Pinellas County Adopt a Drain and it should pop up. And I would love to have you join our program. And if nothing else, there's a really cool way that you can just find out what watershed you live in. So all these different colors, this is Pinellas County, show what watershed you live in and ultimately where the water flows from your property. If you're like, hey, I live, oh, my water goes into Joe's Creek and Joe's Creek has lots of water quality issues. What can I do to help? It just helps you better connect with your local waters. You can scan that QR code. Again, you could just search Pinellas County watersheds and it would pop up as well. And before you run away, thank you for sticking with me. I tried to keep it short for a lunch and learn. I'm gonna launch a poll and then I will also do Q&A while you guys are answering that, if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes. Let me pull up, I see lots of questions, okay. Okay, so where did the number 55% of runoff come from? I, it is from an EPA study. They did several different percentages of impervious cover to show the different, how it would impact stormwater runoff. So it was an EPA study. I can send you the link for that if you want to. If you want more, I, I have everybody's email that registered. Okay. 
Okay, so what is a private lateral connecting to the storm drain? So the private, oh, from that image that I showed you. Let me see if I can go back. This, so in some areas they have, um, like especially for more developed areas like what you're seeing here, they just have like a gutter system type that would direct that stormwater into the stormwater system. So it's a similar concept that you would, you would own that and you would be responsible for that. <clears throat> it's not something typically that's seen in a residential area. And what is the reason of the heavy metal increase? So I haven't seen any data to show that there's an increase in heavy metals. I just know that stormwater is, I hate to say source, but it picks up a lot of heavy metals on its journey just because it's typically traveling along roadways where a lot of heavy metals are accumulating. Okay, and that's all the questions I see in the Q&A. Let me go to the chat. I'll give you a few more minutes if you're answering the poll. Okay, now let's see, what about swimming pool water discharge? What is the proper way to discharge? Yes, I know that is a big challenge because again, I remember growing up in our pool, my dad would just dump it directly into the storm drain and we advise against that. And yes, there are issues with um, vegetation and in your landscape. It's encouraged just that you do it a little bit slowly, like a little bit at a time, which I know, again, it's easier said than done, but it is illegal to dump it directly into the stormwater system. Okay. Is having your yard sprayed once a month for bugs bad for the stormwater runoff? So yeah, I don't want to say yes. So there's lots to factor in there. That, in terms of pesticides, that follows a similar mindset as the fertilizer in that we don't want to use pesticides on just a schedule. It's again, more of a know your plants, know your yard and know, okay, I'm having an issue with this pest. We need to apply pesticides. There's again, a whole webinar series we could do on what we call integrated pest management, where we really resort to pesticides as a last resort. There's a lot of things you can do as an individual to not have to resort to using pesticides. Okay. Okay. The, the elephant in the room is the Piney Point discharges in that area. So to be quite honest, I have not been involved in the Piney Point efforts. We have a Sea Grant agent in our county and she does more marine and coastal outreach and education. So she's really been involved in that. And so I know I would love to be able to comment on that. I just, I don't have the knowledge or expertise too. But yes, I will also acknowledge that is a major concern. Okay. Yes, pressure cleaning is another major source. You can do your homework on companies um, that don't use as many chemicals or different types of chemicals. Honestly, you can typically get away with just using water. <laughs> The water pressure from the pressure cleaning typically does the job. We need resident education. Yes. So we, this is so good. Lots of, lots of comments. Um, yeah. So that is my job. If anyone needs a presentation for their community group or anywhere that you would want me to present, I'm happy to do that. We, in terms of, and I have a lot of short videos. We have a YouTube channel. If you just search Pinellas County Extension YouTube, if you want to share that. I don't have a lot written, but John, I'm happy. If you want to reach out to me, let me go back to my contact info. I'm happy to work with you directly to make some specific materials for your needs. Okay. All the water bodies in my watershed are impaired. Yeah, that's sadly the face, the case with um, most of Pinellas County. Okay, does the county make an effort to manage solid waste that end up flowing in streams before they get to? Yes. So the county has, there's a few different measures in place. Um, if you might be familiar with water goats, it's like a trash catchment system. So some of those are set up in some of the areas where we know there's lots of issues, like Joe's Creek has one. 
and then volunteers go out and clean those out on a regular basis. I believe um, I'm going to blank on the name. There's another one in South County. So they do have a few of those set up in areas where they know solid waste is a big issue. Okay, well, you come into un to incorporated. Yes, I am not limited to unincorporated in my outreach and education, just the adopted drain program right now is only for unincorporated. Good question. Okay, what happens to car wash water? I love that question. So that they are permitted. So all of that water actually goes through the same treatment process as our wastewater system. Okay, and then I think it sounds like maybe I'm missing somebody else's questions in Q&A. Oh, I'm going to end the poll. Sorry, that's still up on your screen. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see. We toured City of St. Pete. They said they never put untreated water into the bay, but the, the county does. So that's a great question, Ruth. I I would not quote me on this. My educated guess would be that they because it's just a city system that they would not typically be overwhelmed at the volume of water that our main water treatment facility is receiving. So our main one is the South Cross Bayou Advanced Water Reclamation Facility and they've received, I don't know the, the numbers, but I would just say significantly more water in general to treat. So therefore they would also receive a significant amount of what we call the inflow and infiltration during a storm event that would overwhelm the system. So that would be my guess. Okay, what do I want people to do with pet poop? That's a great question. I didn't tell you that other than pick it up. <laughs> Just bag it up and dispose it in your regular, your regular garbage can is our best advice for that. Okay, now you guys are so good. Okay. <laughs> are the drains at the bottoms of the interstate ramps county so good question ruth that it totally just depends on the road where they are located because some are state roads some are county roads some are city roads so if you have particular ones that you're curious about i have i can look on my gis system and see well i can at least see if it's county owned and then if not i could probably figure it out but i i unfortunately can't say just based on um that information it might be FDOT. There's several different possibilities of who owns it. Okay. Ruth, if you want to shoot me an email, because I don't know just off the top of my head, I'd have to, again, look on our GIS database, but I'm happy to look that up for you. Okay. You guys have been awesome and amazing. Thank you for sticking around. I know a few people dropped off, but um, thank you for joining me for Lunch and Learn. I have several more coming up in, what's our next month? April. <laughs> I'm doing a whole series on what we call this or that, so totally switching gears to plants and animals, but looking at commonly confused and misidentified species. If you're on Facebook, just follow us on Pinellas Extension, Pinellas County Extension, and you'll see all of the postings and opportunities for upcoming classes there as well. And if you like podcasts, check out Naturally Florida podcast, please. That is a podcast that we do. We release an episode once a month. So. Thank you all for tuning in and have a great rest of your, I don't even know what day it is, Tuesday? Tuesday. Yep. Okay. Bye everybody.